Affinity Photo is a fantastic for retouching. From being able to save preset dodge and burn adjustments to a built-in frequency separation filter that I very much appreciate. And luckily for us, Affinity Photo on the iPad is just as great. The Affinity Photo iPad app has everything that the desktop version does, uh, maybe even a little bit more. In fact, it's the only photo editing app that can currently claim that. I'm Abby Esparza, and I've been creating creative portraits for almost 10 years now, but I do my fair share of a traditional retouching as well. All the resources featured today can be found over on Envato Elements, where you get unlimited downloads of graphics, photos, and fonts, all with super simple commercial licensing. Plus, a no locking contract means you can cancel anytime. Go ahead and subscribe now with the link down in the description. I want to start things off by covering the tools I'll be using. The main and only necessary one is an iPad, of course. I use the 11 inch 2018 Pro model with the latest OS installed. Now there are newer models, but this one still runs like a charm. If you're looking to buy one and haven't committed to a size yet, I would recommend going up to maybe the 12.9 uh, inch model if it's within your budget, just throwing that out there. Otherwise, I very much enjoy this one. And then I have my uh, second generation Apple Pencil with a little sleeve cover on it. I highly recommend investing in one of these if you haven't already. It makes retouching much easier, if not just slightly more intuitive. If you don't have one, you can use your finger for all the techniques we'll be covering today, so don't worry too much about it. You just gain a lot more precision with the pencil. Like I said, it's just a bit more intuitive to draw with a pencil rather than your finger. So now that we know our tools, let's jump into the basics of skin retouching, starting with frequency separation. We'll be focusing on more candid or natural portraits. I always like to point out that it's not about perfecting the skin. Having to retouch skin doesn't mean a person has terrible skin to even begin with. Cameras pick up an amazing amount of detail, more detail at a larger scale than our eyes ever would. We want to retain the person's essence and then remove the details that take away from that. Our first portrait. I'll be importing right from Dropbox. Uh, so here's a quick look at how I go about doing that. But you can import straight from your photos or any other file sharing app. The process may vary slightly, but it should be uh, pretty similar regardless. Now I'm going to go ahead and duplicate our subject by holding down on the canvas and selecting duplicate. I always suggest having a backup copy of your original image, just in case. Finally, let's get to setting up those frequency separation layers. Luckily, Affinity Photo has a built-in filter just for this. We can find our filters right here, and then we can tap all filters to get to our sharpening filters, and that's where frequency separation lives. You can also scroll through all the filters, but this is just much quicker. So go ahead and tap frequency separation. Here we see the image is now split into two layers, a blurry layer and a gray layer. You can adjust these settings down here, but I find the default settings work for most things, so I'm going to just go ahead and tap apply. So our photo should look exactly the same, and that's because what frequency separation does is split the details and color of an image onto two different layers. The gray high frequency layer holds the details, while the blurry low frequency layer holds the color information. By splitting the two, we can, say, remove detail without affecting the color of an area, and vice versa. I like to group my frequency separation layers by selecting both layers. You can tap to select one layer and then swipe to select any others. And then we can tap the group icon here. Now, if we ever need to, we can turn this group off and on and see a quick before and after while retouching. So we know how our layers work. Now we can remove some of these finer lines on the forehead and there are maybe some minor blemishes that can be removed as well. When using frequency separation, I like to start by editing this low layer, the blurrier layer. This is primarily personal preference, however. Your main retouching tools are going to be found right here, bundled with the clone brush. When retouching on the iPad, though, I find the healing brush easiest to use. So let's set up our healing brush. We want the hardness to be 0%. We want the size set to be just a little bigger than whatever it is we're healing. In this case, it's the wrinkles on the forehead. The healing brush works by sampling from one area and then painting that sample onto another. We hold down to select an area to sample from, 
and brush over wherever we want to place that new texture. So you want to sample from a smoother area close to the detail you're trying to remove. And you'll want to resample whenever you move to a new area. You might also need to adjust the size and hardness of your brush as you go. Now, I do prefer my finger for that part. However, I do like to use my Apple Pencil when smoothing larger areas of skin. I set my brush to be a bit bigger, or a lot bigger actually, but then I lower the opacity to just 15%, and that way I'm smoothing but not removing. While I like my pencil, you can absolutely use your finger to do this, uh, no worries. So this is a good trick if you have a lot of little texture you want to get rid of. But be very, very careful with it. It can be so easy to overdo, and you'll end up with almost rubber-looking skin, which is <laughs> never the look we're going for. And that's because while all the sharper detail is on that high layer, the lower layer also holds a lot of detail, more than you might suspect for such a blurry layer. If you oversmooth this layer, your skin will look overly retouched even when you turn that high layer back on. Retouching skin is all about restraint. So we've done a uh, lot on this low layer. Let's turn on our high layer. And then we can toggle our frequency separation group off and on to see a, a nice before and after. You should try and check back on your original image every once in a while just to gauge what you've done so far and what you still need to do. If you have several retouch layers, you can always make a copy of that original subject and bring it to the top of your layer stack. Then you can just toggle that layer on and off. Uh, but this looks good, so let's edit some of these creases out on that high layer. Oh, we could use the healing brush, but I actually prefer the end painting tool for this. For our brush settings, again, we want the size to just be slightly bigger than the blemishes we're removing. And we want to bring the hardness to 70%, and that's very important because things will look overly blurry if this brush is too soft. I don't recommend going up to a full 100% hardness though, because you can then start seeing the stroke marks. A 70% seems to be the golden number for this. And to use the inpainting brush, we just drag over the areas we want to remove. Unlike the healing brush, uh, we don't have to even sample an area. It's best to paint over one blemish at a time instead of a bunch at once, and smaller little strokes tend to do a little bit better. And you'll also want to be very mindful of areas that look overly blurry or pixelated after using the inpainting brush, which can definitely happen from time to time. If that does happen, just undo using two finger tap and then repaint that area. Try and keep the more prominent creases on the skin. Removing too much from a face will make it seem lifeless and just devoid of character, you know? I always say temporary blemishes, however, like pimples or scratches, are fair game, as they aren't permanent features. You should always ask about things like scars, freckles, or moles. Again, those types of things are distinct features on a person's face so I only remove them if requested. And that's frequency separation. The name makes it sound a bit fancier than it actually is. One final tip though, if you find that you've over-retouched your image, happens sometimes, and you need to fix it in a hurry, you can always select your frequency separation group, go into the layer options right here, and then lower its opacity. This will bring back a small amount of the image's original detail without completely undoing all of your work. Now on to dodging and burning. A dodging and burning is just darkening or brightening a part of an image. A dodging is brightening, while burning is darkening. You can use this to retouch skin, but today we'll use it to more so enhance the skin or the facial structure, bringing out the natural contours of the face. Later in the course, we'll also use dodge and burn to enhance eyes and hair, but first let's focus on the face structure. This is also known as contouring.
Now there are a few different ways you can dodge and burn. You can do it directly onto your image using the dodge and burn tools, of course, but that permanently affects the pixels on your image, making it very, very destructive. There is a trick using a 50% gray layer that a lot of people like. Still, I'm not going to cover that because I think the absolute best and most non-destructive way to dodge and burn is to use curve adjustment layers. Setting them up is super simple. Let's go right into our adjustments panel and choose curves. In our bottom options, uh, we want to open the spline setting, or what I call the curve. This first curve will be our burn layer, so we want it to darken. Let's place a point on the darker tones and then pull that down. There we go. Now this is looking good. Let's go back to our layers panel and name the layer burn. Now we have to make the uh, dodge layer. I'm just going to press down on the canvas and duplicate the burn curve. Then I can just go right into the settings, change it from dark to light, and then we can hide the burn layer uh, to better see our dodge effect if we need to. We of course want to rename this layer from burn to dodge or else it's going to get very, very confusing. And there we have a dodge layer. Let's turn our burn layer back on. And finally, we're going to fill each adjustment layer with black using the flood fill tool right here. This will mask the adjustments. Adjustment layers come with a built-in mask, so you don't need to add a layer mask. Just mask directly on the adjustment itself. So like with our frequency separation layers, we want to group the two curves together so we can toggle them on and off and check our work as we go. Now let's grab the paintbrush and set our color to white because we're going to mask in our dodge and burn layers. For the brush settings, you'll change the size to fit whatever you're painting. You'll change it a lot, of course. However, I like to set the opacity to 50% or lower and the flow to 20% or lower. This will allow us to build up that dodge and burn uh, very, very slowly. We don't want to be heavy handed here. If you have a pencil, you'll definitely want to use it. We'll dodge the areas we want to be brighter and burn the places we want to be darker. This is often about following the natural shapes and contour of the face, especially for, you know, candid or natural portraits. Remember that anything you add light to will stand out and almost be pushed forward, while adding dark to something will push it back. Think of things as if light is hitting it versus is light not hitting it. If you feel your dodge or burn layer is a bit too intense, you can always lower the opacity of the individual layer or the entire group. And of course, you can go back and edit that spline setting of your curves. This is why I feel this dodge and burn method is far better than the other options out there. It's entirely non-destructive and can be adjusted and edited anytime. You can even make multiple dodge and burn layers if you want to. You can also use them to add general contrast to an image. Uh, they give you much more control compared to, say, a brightness contrast layer or even an S-curve adjustment. Like I said, we'll be revisiting dodge and burn a little later, uh, but this covers the basics. Now let's take a break from cleaning up the skin and move on to cleaning up the hair. We'll focus on more so removing the flyaway hair strands from the uh, background, which will result in smoother looking hair. We'll be revisiting our good friend, the in-painting brush, but there are some minor differences when using it with hair versus on skin, like we've already done. So I definitely wanted to cover this you know, separately. So let's grab that end painting tool and set it up in a way that's more ideal for hair. First, the size should be pretty small, just a little bigger than the hair strands we're removing. And we want the opacity and flow to both be 100%, but the hardness should be zero. Nice and soft. Most importantly, we want to make sure and change the source to current and below. 
This means it will sample from the layer we're painting on and any other visible layers below it. This means we can create a new pixel layer by tapping right here, and then we paint on this layer. When we painted, it sampled from that blank layer, which is nothing. However, it also sampled from the subject. This means all of our in-painting strokes will be on a separate layer from our photo. Let's remove a bunch of the hair strands, just like we did the blemishes and wrinkles on the skin. I'm going to be a bit heavy-handed and leave a lot of those blurry or odd-looking paint strokes so I can show you why we created that pixel layer, though I'm sure you can guess. I'm also only going to focus on the uh, flyaways kind of on the background here, but you can also use this trick on the inner parts of the hair. So this is looking okay, but like I said, I have quite a lot of uh, patchy areas that simply don't look great. But all I have to do to fix them is grab the eraser brush and blend them away. I can then jump back and forth between the eraser brush and the in-painting brush to further refine the edges of the hair. This is another example of taking a destructive technique and making it non-destructive. At no point is our original image being edited. Everything is reversible at any time. Which is always the goal. When you're creating and painting layers like this, I do recommend having a layer for the background flyaway hairs, and then a separate layer for the, you know, messy inner hairs. And that way you can erase one without worrying about erasing the other. Removing flyaways can take some time. We are talking about dozens of little hair strands after all. But while it's time consuming, it's just very straightforward. And you can use this technique to remove lint or dirt from clothes, any little detail that you just don't want to be there anymore. The end painting tool is just surprisingly helpful in retouching in general. Let's switch to a new image with a bit more hair so we can look at how to add a healthy shine to it. I think a shampoo commercial. We'll be using dodge and burn curves just like before, but we'll be looking at a new blending setting and it's actually one of my favorite tools. As always, I started with a duplicated layer just in case. It's just a habit to get into. The effect we're about to do is 100% non-destructive. But let's set up our burn layer. So adjustments, curves, then we're going to go into the spline and bring down the curve to darken. Next, we're going to go into our layer options. Right at the bottom, above the colors, we see two boxes here, a source and dest. Dest is short for destination, meaning the layer underneath this one. Let's select that destination box. Uh, what this is is a curve that we can use to blend the layer away from specific values. Values being the lights and darks of an image. So if we drag the top right point down to the bottom right corner, the image begins to brighten. The burn layer is blended away from the brightest points of the photo. We can then create a new point to drag down and make that curve even steeper. If we flip this layer on and off, uh, we can see that that curve layer now only affects the darker parts of the image. Let's create a dodge curve next. Now let's go into the destination setting. And we want to do a similar curve here, only flipped. So instead of bringing down the right side, we'll bring down the left. Remember, these layers are for the hair, so ignore how this affects the skin or background or anything that isn't the hair. We want the lighter portions of the hair to be extra light, just like we wanted the darker parts of the hair to be extra dark with that burn layer. This is all looking good. So let's fill both curve adjustments with black. Remember, they have built-in layer masks. Boom, boom. Now we can dodge and burn the hair with a soft brush. 
Just like with the face, we want the opacity and flow to be lower and the hardness to be 0%. That being said, thanks to the blending settings we added in the layer options, we can be much less precise with where we paint, because now we don't have to worry about the highlights getting into the shadows or vice versa. You can always go back and adjust those blending settings if you need to, they are non-destructive. And remember, you can also change the curve or spline setting. So if this effect just isn't intense enough for you, go and bring up the dodge curve or lower that burn curve. If you went a little overboard, you can lower the opacity of the layers. You have all the freedom of dodge and burn, but now each layer is constrained to its relevant area. Or more so, value. Lights with lights, darks with darks. And that's why I suggest creating a new set of dodge and burn for different areas. One set for the skin and contour of the face, one for the hair, and coming up we'll use them on a pair of eyes. In fact, we can start on those eyes right now. So the secret to great eyes in a photo is to actually capture them in camera. This means that you want to make sure a subject already at least has some kind of highlight in their eye. Uh, then we can go in after and build and improve on what's you know, naturally there. Suppose the eyes have zero light, especially if they're missing that nice bit of catch light right in the reflection. In that case, it's going to be near impossible to artificially add that in, and it not look overdone. They don't have to be perfect, but we want to have at least some kind of base to work with. So try and keep that in mind while shooting. So for the eyes, we're going to use the blending settings we just learned, and we're going to dodge and burn, but we'll use a different set of layers. This is just an alternative option to the curve layers. You could absolutely use the curve layers if you wanted to. Let's start with creating a new pixel layer at the top of our layer stack. And we're going to set that layer to soft light. We can also name this layer dodge. And we're just going to focus on the dodge layer for now. So let's grab the brush tool. We want the size to be smaller than our subject's iris, so fairly small and we want the opacity no higher than 50%, with the flow being just 10% or even lower than that, with a 0% hardness. And this will give us a very, very soft brush that will build light up slowly. For the color, I'm just going to go with flat white, but you can absolutely experiment with bringing in a lighter, paler version of the subject's eyes, existing color, and that'll help keep things from looking too dull. But I'm just going to go with white. <laughs> and we're going to brighten the bottom portion of the iris, right where there is already some natural light. Try to be precise, but don't worry too much. We'll clean up the highlight with those blending options. So this is looking fine. Let's go into the layer options. We're going to go back into that destination blending setting and make a steep curve on the left side of the grid. When using this tool, don't be overly worried about you know, what my curve ends up looking like. Instead, keep an eye on the layer you're trying to blend. Every curve will look absolutely different, and every image will need a different setting. There's no magic number here. We can also lower the opacity of the layer if we need to, as always, and this will give us a really nice catch light right in the eyes. And we can now add some contrast to the eyes using the same method, only using a burn layer instead of a dodge layer. So let's create a new pixel layer, set it to soft light, though you can also experiment with overlay. And with the same brush, let's paint black to deepen the eye's outer iris and pupil. You don't want to be too heavy handed with either of these layers, it can be easy to go a little overboard on eyes.
And just like before, uh, with this initial bit of paint looking okay, we can adjust its destination blending, removing the burn from the image's highlights. Remember, bringing down the left point will remove the layer from the darker values, while the right point controls the lighter values. I'm also going to go ahead and bring the burn layer down to just 50%, as I do want it to be pretty subtle. I have just one more layer I like to add to my eyes. This will brighten the overall eye a bit more, but more importantly, enhance the color just a tiny, tiny bit. Let's create a new pixel layer and set it to color dodge here. And we're going to use the same brush for this, but we want to change the color. We'll use the eyedropper tool to grab a color from the lighter portion of the iris. We want a color that best represents the color of the eyes as a whole. So in this case, he has a very lovely shade of green. And we're going to paint this color all over the iris. You can build it up a bit thicker on the brighter portion of the eye if you want to brighten that area further. This effect, all in all, will be very subtle. But since we dodged and burned using black and white, we want to make sure none of the eye color was washed out in the process. Which is usually the downside of using whites and blacks. And the eyes are just an important part of a portrait, so we really want to take our time here. And we're moving our way down the face, finishing off the face with teeth. Not adding them in, uh, just whitening them. I always recommend doing just a small amount of whitening uh, because there are several variables to a person's teeth looking unnaturally yellow, more yellow than they actually are. Uh, lighting being a big offender here, a warm light to be specific. We're gonna start things off by removing the yellow and then follow up with a tiny little touch of brightening. <laughs> to tackle the yellow, let's create an HSL adjustment right at the top of our current layer stack. We're going to go into Ranges and select the yellow channel. And let's turn the saturation all the way up to 100%. This is just so we can see what areas of the image are being affected. On the hue circle here, we can move the points to further dial in on the exact yellow tone that we want, which is the yellow tone on the teeth. The default points already do a pretty good job, still we can make some minor adjustments just by sliding the points, bringing them all maybe a little closer together. I also want a little less red uh, to be in this range, so less of the gums are being grabbed. This isn't going to be perfect or anything, it's no big deal. Keep in mind, these settings will vary wildly from image to image. I wouldn't try and replicate the locations of my points, but instead just pay close attention to your own photo and how it's being affected by the sliders. And great, now our teeth are looking extra yellow, which is what we want. <laughs> just stay with me on this one. Let's fill the adjustment layer with black and grab a semi-soft round brush. We can bring the flow and opacity to 100%, and set the hardness to around, I don't know, let's say 30%. Give or take. And we're going to mask back in the yellow teeth. Try to stay on just the teeth, avoiding the gums. I like to make the teeth yellow and then mask, instead of removing the yellow first, because I can just see things better this way. Which, you know, seeing comes in handy while masking. Who'd have thunk? We can always come back and refine this mask, uh, so let's finally remove this yellow. Let's go into our HSL setting and return to the yellow tones. Now we're going to bring down the saturation. You don't want to go too far. I never bring it below maybe 50% max. We want healthy white teeth, uh, not gray teeth. So after reducing the yellow, our teeth look you know, whiter, but they look pretty dull. Uh, let's brighten them using a brightness contrast adjustment, right above the HSL layer. And then we can bring the brightness pretty high, like 50%. The exact number doesn't matter, again, this is just so we'll be able to see uh, exactly what's going on. Now, you could mask this, uh, just as is, but I prefer to do some blending using that destination setting. 
It works particularly well here, as the teeth are naturally brighter than the gums, so we'll be able to pinpoint the brightness contrast layer right on those teeth. The more you use these blending options, the better you'll get at you know, nailing the exact curve that you want in a hurry. It's one of my favorite settings, so if you're not a fan just yet, I'll try and give it some time. Once the blending is looking good, we can now fill the brightness contrast layer with black and mask just like we did with the HSL layer. I'm also going to group these layers together so I can easily toggle them on and off. Again, this is very subtle, but we don't want their teeth looking like headlights on a car. Uh, just a nice, bright, but natural smile. Keep in mind, some people's teeth just naturally lean yellow. Some people's teeth naturally lean a bit blue. No one's teeth are gray and uh, shine light physically out of their mouth, however. So maybe we should avoid that. Just a thought. And we're going to finish things off with some quick final touches and corrections, and just cover some tools you'll likely be using quite a bit, even if they aren't as exciting. Starting with the good old crop tool. So our crop tool is located right here, and if we select it, we can use the handles to adjust the size and ratio of the crop. This includes dragging it around by holding the inside of the cropped area. If you want to keep the ratio of your image, you can set it to original ratio, right here. And suppose you have a specific ratio in mind, like a square one by one. In that case, you can choose custom ratio and input your ratio. And finally, right at the bottom here, we have resample. This lets you choose the size based on units. So if you want the image to be a specific size in inches, you can set the unit and just adjust the crop. Now if we look here, we have an arrow icon, and this shows us there's even more crop tools available. We can change the overlay, which can be very useful. And we can also toggle on the darken feature which I prefer to use as it kind of helps me visualize the final crop at least a bit better. If we tap here, we can rotate the crop, flipping it from horizontal to vertical, and back again. And finally, we have the straighten tool, which is super handy for landscapes. We're going to draw the line right over the horizon, and Affinity Photo will then straighten the image based on that line. And don't forget that cropping is non-destructive, so if you ever need to adjust your crop, then go for it. Now let's talk about color correcting, or more specifically, fixing overexposed images. An overexposed image or area simply means it's too bright or blown out, so bright that the area now lacks detail. I refer to spots like these as hot spots. And I have some good news and some bad news. The good, hot spots can be fixed pretty easily. The bad, that's only if they can be fixed, because sometimes they can't. Uh, let's take a look at why. So here we have areas that are overexposed or what I call hot spots. Visually, we can't see much detail in these areas. Now we fix hotspots by darkening those areas in the hopes that there's hidden detail there, and that darkening that detail will bring the detail out. But if we create a curves layer, and bring down the curves the middle point right here, no matter how dark we make the image, those areas stay flat white. And that's because those areas simply have no information in them. They are just flat white. You can't darken what doesn't exist. We can bring out detail if it's hidden, but we can't create detail from nothing. So in this case, sadly, we can't fix these overexposed areas on the dress. Let's switch to a new image. 
Skies, especially bright skies, are very, very prone to being overexposed. Luckily, a lot of the time you'll be able to bring out at least some of the cloud detail using curves. So let's create a curve and bring down the spline, which is a fun word. Placing the point right in the middle of the grid and pulling down. Now let's fill that layer with black. Because guess what? We're gonna mask. Let's grab a very soft round brush, so 0% hardness and a very low flow and opacity. You really want to slowly build up the darkness when you do this. And that's because we want most of the darkness to be on the outer portions of the sky, and then we'll slowly, very slowly, blend it out the closer we get to that subject. Because we don't want the subject to be darker, we just want the detail in the sky to be darker. Again, this is another case where a pencil definitely comes in handy. And with that looking pretty good, we can bring in a just a touch of color to the sky using that same curve layer. Well, why not? Let's go into the uh, settings here and cycle to the blue channel. And we can bring up the left point to introduce some blue into the darker portions of the sky. Not too much, just enough. Now let's talk color grading, or more specifically, how to use LUTs on Affinity Photo for the iPad. Because yes, you absolutely can, thank you. LUTs are my absolute favorite way to color grade an image, and we can download them right off the internet using our iPad. No need to uh, fluff about on our computer for this. I'm going to go ahead and download this pack from Envato Elements, though there are thousands to choose from but it seems on theme for our photo. Hit download, and then download again. And once it's done, we can press open in, and we'll open into downloads. It'll be downloaded as a dot zip, so we can go ahead and unzip that by pressing, holding, and selecting uncompress. Now all of our LUTs are in a standard folder which means we can go right back into Affinity Photo and create a LUT adjustment. In the lower settings bar, we'll select Load. Where this opens will just depend on your iPad. And where the download is located will also depend on either your browser or where you may have manually saved it. For me, it's in On My iPad. And then I go into Chrome. Here I'll find all my LUTs and all I have to do is choose one. Boom. Instant color grade. Maybe this is a LUT I use all the time, and I don't want to constantly have to, you know, re-download it. If that's the case, we can always save it as a preset. Or we can automatically import a LUT as a preset by going to the LUT presets, clicking the hamburger menu here, that's the three lines, and choosing import LUT and that LUT will be automatically added to your presets. Having a solid library of LUTs makes editing photos so much more fun. I highly recommend using them if you don't already. And that brings us to the end of our retouching adventure with Affinity Photo on the iPad. My advice is to always Keep it simple, uh, keep it natural, and make sure the portrait still looks like the person after retouching. There is just a big difference between the world of artistic composites, high-end retouching, and candid portraits. While they use a lot of the same methods, tools, and techniques, the latter needs much more restraint. Whether it's frequency separation or dodging and burning, don't be afraid to you know, look at what you've done and just pull back. Just a smidge. <laughs> but I think that's gonna do it for today. If that wasn't enough and you're looking to learn even more, why not check out some of the other awesome videos that Envato Touch Plus has to offer. If you liked this video, uh, consider giving us a like and even subscribing if you haven't already. And don't forget to click the little bell icon to be notified of all new videos, including tips, tricks, and of course, tutorials. Happy retouching. See you next time, guys.